So hi there. So this is about uh, making a couch matter or four questions uh, to ask when creating augmented reality experiences. So this is my first new talk since I left Magic Leap. So we'll see how this goes. But it hasn't been signed off by lawyers or anything. It's a miracle. Um, seriously, it's been 12 years since I could say that. Uh, so hi, I'm James. Um, the details were already sort of there, but I started off in Vancouver and went to Montreal and came to Wellington and went back to Toronto and then I was with Magic Leap and Weta Workshop and we were doing a lot of fun stuff. The collaboration there was really positive. Um, myself and about 15 of us were employed by Magic Leap and uh, Weta Workshop was mostly on the art production and audio side. Um, and so day to day we worked in what we called the game shop and then in April when Magic Leap imploded, so did we. Um, and so we had to figure out what was next um, and 10 of us got together and formed uh, NZXR um, I promise we registered the domain about three days before we heard about the NZXR uh, like initiative. And then it, by that point it was too late, so we're like, eh, we'll deal. Um, so hi, we're from NZXR. Um, so the couch, why does the couch matter? And where, where did that actually come from? Cast your mind back to last year when we could travel and stuff. And um, we were in South Korea. Uh, this is um, Graham Devine, who was at the time Magic Leap's chief game wizard. Um, at this point, he really looks much more wizardly. I've gone from zero beard to some beard. He's gone from some beard to much beard. Um, and we were sitting there doing a fireside chat thing, and we were talking about how to describe AR to people um, and why it's different than other mediums. And one of us said, the couch matters. And because there's no recording of this, we don't actually know which one of us does, and we just keep pointing at the other guy. So anyways, me or Graham said this, and now I'm stuck with it. So the couch matters because it is a common object which everyone is familiar with and it offers lots and lots of opportunities for things to go right or wrong in an augmented reality space. It's surfaces, it's an opportunity to sit, it's a thing I can interact with. It's a large object, but still movable. So there's lots of different ways that the couch can actually become part of an experience. And of course that extends out to every other bit of furniture, but couches are fun, so we stick with that. Um, so four questions. What I'm just trying to think about, okay. What I was trying to think about um, coming into this was really like, how do I think about AR experiences? Because I've been really privileged to spend five years doing nothing but that with a head-mounted device, which is wacky, right? Like, no one in their right mind is funding teams to do it for that length of time because there's not a commercial case unless you happen to be first party for a company like this. So, first question, what's your goal? Pretty straightforward. Um, are you making a game? Are you training people? Are you trying to create immersive art or theater? Um, what are you doing with this stuff, right? So you need to know your goal. Now this is universal. It doesn't matter if you're making an AR experience or a movie or writing a short story. You need to have a goal. Um, in the case of AR, what's important is how are you involving the world? So I'm going to take a really, really simple goal, and yours will be much grander and more interesting. Um, but for example, I'd like to make a puzzle game. Well, that's cool. What does that tell me about AR stuff? Well, I want to make a puzzle game about color matching. All right, well, that's a little bit more interesting. There's actually some detail there. There's something to grips on. But it doesn't involve the real world. But I want to make a game about matching colors in the world around you so that I'm combining. I know where all these colors are. OK, that's significantly more interesting. Now I have a goal in mind that's fairly focused. It's not really, please get better than this, but you get the idea. Um, so then what are you adding to the physical world, and why are you adding those things? You've got your goal, and you're like, all right, we're going to put stuff in the world. Um, sometime, I don't know, I think it was last year, um, I was at one of the big banks um, having a chat with one of their technical innovation teams and talking to them about AR stuff and, and the Magic Leap hardware and all that sort of jazz. And um, one of the folks there got really excited. This is a very technically savvy person, you know, really understands the, the world that they work in. And they said, oh, so we could have like, you know, a virtual vault, and then like another virtual vault, you could like take your money from your bank account and like take it to this vault, and then that's how you would transfer money. I'm like, you could totally do that. That would work. But you've got an app, and I use it every day, and it takes two seconds. What you just described is probably going to take two minutes. And that's if you've cracked all the UX paradigms and everything else that have to go into it, right? And it's like, ah, so it's, why are you putting this thing in the real world? There's got to be a good reason for this. This is an example of a really good reason, right? This is um, uh, Trimble's um, XR10, which is a HoloLens 2 stuck inside of a hard hat, which is a good idea um, when you're on a building site, and their Connect platform. And as you can see, this lets you see the world as it's intended to be. Um, and it's quite a fun uh, way to be able to see stuff, and it's super, super helpful and collaborative. So there's, to me, I think, 
when I think about this stuff, I think about giving people superpowers, right? Like ways to see the world in a different model, or sorry, ways to both see and interact with the world that you can't otherwise do. Um, so consider your superpowers, they're fun. So then you know what you're trying to put in the world, where it's headed, um, but how is this experience actually going to interface with the physical world? And this is where stuff gets fairly tricky, right? Um, because once we actually start trying to put digital content into the real world, things can break down quickly. Um, but the most simple, like the start case right now for most AR, right? This is um, AR Kit's quick look from Apple. Like you can just drop a 3D object on a plane and away you go. That's cool. Um, and we're starting to see some interesting examples of that use case. And all it is is just grabbing a single plane. All it is, all the computer vision people are like, what? Um, it's a lot, but it's fast now. For example, this was um, Civilization's AR, so Nexus Studios built this for BBC. You can bring in these artifacts and look at them in x-ray vision, you can spin them around, you can uh, place them in the world, but fundamentally it's not doing too much more than using the planes. So I, I like to think of planes as sort of the most permissive form of AR. It's the way that phones can very quickly um, uh, find that surface and use it, um, and it's the one that like when you think about tabletop style experiences where stuff just sort of sits up on the table with you, it's not hard to find that surface, usually. If, on the other hand, you want to integrate with the physical world and actually have stuff, then you're trying to do something like what we did with Dr. Gorgort's Invaders, um, which looks something like this. Um, I don't know if it's, I just sort of hear it, but... Um, but you can see that the, the robot's actually falling, being occluded by the couch there um, at the beginning this portal, and it actually looks better than this in person, the pass-through capture is a thing, but um, you can see that the, uh, like the scorch marks and stuff actually stick to the environment, you can burn the couch. So we're, really, we're doing a lot of stuff around character navigation, for example, um, and understanding the world. So this you know, brown blobs here, hey, that's a couch. Couch matters. The couch is involved. Um, this is a, a, a simulation of a player moving around. That's what that wireframe is. And then we're dynamically trying to place stuff in the, in the world. And so the number of choices and rules that you have to build up so that the content knows where it can belong is huge. You know, this was seven years for us of a huge amount of research and development. Um, and you can see here, this is a character, you know, taking that same bit of information, using it to navigate, trying to get at the player, get clear line of sight so they can take a shot at them. And we were working with the teams that were building this hardware and software every single day. So this was really like quite a privileged opportunity for us and a lot of fun and super freaking hard. Um, but it was really neat. So we have all of this tech and all of this stuff. But at the end of the day, it's actually not hugely different than what you can get out of a phone now. You just got to know what rules you're building. So planes, for example, are a thing. This is a screenshot from Unity's um, new Mars add-on, which is really, really impressive. Um, and does a lot of very cool stuff. Strongly recommend checking it out. So you've got planes, that's sort of like the basic building block of most AR experiences. You've got your dense mesh, actually knowing about that mesh, which allows you to do things like occlusion and get kind of fancy in there. Um, compass and geolocation, incredibly important, especially if you want to have an experience that knows something about the outside world. Knowing which way someone is aligned and where they are, relatively speaking, in a geolocative sense, you can do lots of stuff with it. And there's already way more kind of types of information you can get, and lots more coming online all the time. So many, many options, and the couch still matters. But you can see, this is in, in Mars here, these are planes that are being defined out and as useful, usable spaces, right? And then lastly, how are people going to use this thing, right? So we know what we're trying to make, we know what we're trying to stick in the world, we know how it's gonna like interact with the world, but if nobody can use it, did you even build it? Um, the major platforms, things like Snap and um, Google's lenses and whatnot, they have interaction models that are fairly simple, usually you know, around touch or hold, sometimes scaling and rotation. And so there is some onboarding there and some expectation and experience from the users already. Um, but most other places, most other things you find, nobody knows. <laughs> There's an emerging body of work uh, around AR and VR interactions. I strongly recommend checking out what's out there and how it's going. There's things like VRTK. There's, you know, and I mentioned Unity already. Epic's doing similar stuff in Unreal. Um, but nobody's really done much of this yet. Like, 
pretty much whatever you're going to do is probably going to be one of the first things in the world that does that thing. So embrace the fact that it's just going to be weird and hard. Um, and things can operate on a massive spectrum. So we didn't know who was going to play Dr. Gorbort's Invaders. Right? We knew that it had to work for every single person who put a magic leap one on their head. They had to have a good time. Now historically, first person shooters, action games, those are not typically very accessible games for a wide audience, especially if they involve um, you know, mouse and keyboard controls or a twin analog stick. Learning to move with one set and look with the other is like worse than trying to you know, rub your tummy and pat your head at the same time. It's really tough. So we want everybody to be able to play this thing. Uh, don't know why the frame rate's gone to terrible. <laughs> um, that's my mom. <laughs> my mom's never played any of the games I've ever worked on. Uh, and she asked me to bring this device back, um, which was wild. Am I out of time? Uh, okay. um, so this was obviously something for an incredibly broad audience. This led us to do things like say, we can only use two buttons. We're not using multimodal buttons. We're going to use single gestures, so because we've got gesture detection and all the rest of it. Um, so we wanted to make sure that this stuff could work for everybody. And that takes a lot of work to make something feel that easy. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, you've got a specialist audience. So again, I'm kind of going back to the Trimble example here. But this is a data-heavy um, setup. And it's in a specialist field. People who are used to working in construction, they're going to know what this information means when they look at it, hopefully. And they also, because it's on site and um, it has legal and safety implications, they're also going to receive training in this stuff. Whereas invaders like put it on, shoot some robots, it should just work. This is, you can get quite in depth. Now I'm sure Trimble's UX team is like just as concerned about removing friction as we are, but what the important parts of their friction are very, very different from ours. So there's quite a spectrum of things you can play with. Ultimately, though, like your success or failure does begin and end with your interactions. So you've got all these different tools available to you from gesture. Um, this is the control from the ML1, which is a sixed off controller. Um, of course, if you're on a VR headset, then you've got similar sorts of things. Um, where people are looking, right? Eyes are really useful for lots of different stuff. Uh, be prepared to spend a lot of time tuning for that, though. People's eyes do not do the things you expect. <laughs> and things like head pose, right? Knowing just where someone is looking, how they're moving, the amount of motion that they've got going on, we can get tons of information out of that. And that's just a handful of like, those are our source inputs. And then all of the interactions that you make, whatever experience it is that you're making, those are going to be very specific to the challenge that you have in front of you. Even a gesture like the pinch and kind of zoom that we're starting to see emerge as a bit of a standard. Um, how exactly you get a hold of that virtual object, how much it moves, the type of rotation you can do with it, and why that's important for your experience is going to be quite different from experience to experience. So you've always got to be testing. So just always be testing. So four things. And so how do you test for this stuff? If it's your goal, get feedback, right? Duh. Um, talk to your target audience early and often, especially if it's for something related to training. Talk to your subject matter experts. Talk to people who are going to be using this training. Absolutely crucial. Um, what do you add in the physical world and why? Consider what uh, experts in the field already have access to and whether you're adding friction intentionally or not, right? There are lots of tools out there, and if somebody you know, it might not be an appropriate use case for an AR application if you're somewhere where the tech just doesn't work. You might want to fall back on 2D pen and paper. That's totally okay. Give people the right tool for the right job. How is this going to interface with the physical world? Um, I cannot stress this strongly enough. Get a test application up and running as quickly as you can on your intended target device, and then walk around the world where you think you're going to be using this application and see how the computer sees the world because it's going to see things that you don't expect and it's going to miss things that you think are obvious. And if you're not building from that ground truth, you're going to find yourself in a very complicated position when you're like, so the robots come out of the wall. We don't know where the walls are. You know, how far can you get down that path? Very. Um, and lastly, yeah, how are people going to use it? So this primary interaction model that you choose, um, that's going to be baked into absolutely everything about the experience from the assumptions about how you make content to how people interact with it. It's massive. 
Um, and the further into development that you get, the more assumptions are going to be layered on top of that interaction model. And if you haven't tested that thing and made sure that it's doing the thing that you want, you're four months, five months down the track, and if you need to change what that core thing is, the whole house of cards is going to come down on top of you. So, test for these things. Thanks. And I totally forgot to put the microphone on. <laughs>